Welcome tonight. It's Bishop Kevin L. Kello of The Gathering Echo. And we're coming to you from New Testament Church of the Firstborn, started back in uh, 1988, uh, ratified as a, uh, a gospel center on uh, July 1st of 1988. Started on February the 14th, Valentine's Day, because Jesus was our sweetheart. And I'm glad to report that we are still in love with Him, and He certainly is in love with us. So we're glad we welcome you here tonight. There was a lot of viewing uh, on uh, last Sunday. Uh, Michael Hawkins is uh, out with his son. They're at a, uh, I think they call it cross country. They do this distance running. So he has taken his son Caden to get that done. And I had taught the Sunday before. And tonight's sermon, we're going to begin with the ideal of regeneration and the regeneration. And that is uh, the metanoia of a realization of where you originated from. Now, I know in the gospel belt, everyone uses, depends on, and leans on almost holistically the rebuke of Jesus to Nicodemus that uh, he tells him to be born again. Well, when Jesus had spoke about it in Matthew's gospel, he said the regeneration. His apostle also, uh, and that's Matthew 19, 28, is where we're going to start. He said it also through his apostle Paul in Titus 3, 5, that this is the washing and the regeneration of renewing and restoring of the Holy Ghost. And that's how his cousin announced Jesus. Before the cross, before the shedding of the blood, he said, He's come here to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, it's very interesting because Jesus, uh, while being carried uh, in the immaculate conception of the virgin birth, after Mary was overshadowed uh, by the Holy Ghost, by the Father, as Matthew and Luke lay that out, she is whispered to by the angel Gabriel, which is another revelation of Jesus Christ, which means God is a man. So God was about to take upon Himself flesh, the very ideal of making man in His image, likeness, and dominion. The image would ha take on a body, uh, the likeness would take on soul, and of course the dominion would be the Holy Spirit. Now that was always the original plan, that was laid out in Genesis 1.26. Now Galatians 4 said, God in the fullness of times sent forth His Son made of a woman. So now what God talked us all as spirits into in Christ in the beginning, God said, it's my turn. It behooved Him, Hebrews 2 said, to be made like unto His brethren. So now God is going to take on the same body that we have been given through the procreation of our mothers and fathers. Now God is stepping into eternity. God is moving into humanity, which is an overall tapestry and mosaic of Himself and all these different individuals. The Father manifesting His glory, now He takes on flesh, and it is the embodiment of the Word seen in humanity. And this is what makes Jesus so specifically interesting, that He was the Word made flesh, and as uh, the Apostle would say in 1 Timothy 3.16, that without controversy, the mystery of God is great. But now it's been revealed unto us by His holy apostles and prophets, that's Ephesians 3, that God was manifest in the flesh. God was seen of angels. God was preached unto the Gentiles. God was received up into glory. Now, that same God was received up into glory, and He created a new covenant. That new covenant is based on grace, 
And yet I find many people that aren't that graceful towards others. They're graceful for some things, if they like you, if they're uh, cosmetically getting along with you, but the moment something becomes tenuous or difficult, you'll find that your past will be brought up and things will be used against you. And apparently, for the, the sins or wrongs of your past will be brought back up and used against you. This is not the grace of God. Jesus reminds us all, if you do not forgive every man from your heart, you've got to let go of it. It's a poison. Holding bitterness and grudges is something that we were warned of by James. Grudge not, ye one against another. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Grudges defile you. And remember, if you defile this body, uh, there will be a destruction because your body, your temple, was created to house the Father, the Holy Ghost, as a manifestation of love, mercy, and forgiveness towards others. So let's get good at forgiveness. I see people want to practice everything but forgiveness, but then they can remind you that this person did this, and they did that. And, you know, I was astounded decades ago of a man that just criticized another preacher terribly. And this was in, uh, let's see, the mid-80s. And he brought up a person's past that happened back in the mid-60s. I said, whoa, hey, time out, TV time out. I said, that's about 25 years ago. I said, I'm pretty sure that's a technical foul. I said, you're still remembering that? And they use that type of hard line to not be forgiving, not be merciful, and to cut people off and then say, oh, I've forgiven them, but I talk about them, I stab them in the back, and I have nothing else to do with them. That's not forgiveness, my friend. That's not what Jesus manifested. So in the regeneration, we have in Matthew a little story here about a rich man. It's going to start in Matthew 19, 23. A rich man wants to get into the kingdom of God. And there's nothing wrong with that. Rich people can come into the kingdom of God. They're welcomed in the kingdom of God. Because God, it is God that has given them power to get their wealth. So you can be rich. Just remember that with that gift of getting wealth, that you take that richness and you establish His covenant in the earth that you remember the Lord's work in your wealth and in your richness so that the blessing of the Lord will really make you rich and add no sorrow to go with it. That's good truth right there. So, then said Jesus unto His disciples, I want to tell you a story, boys, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, that euphemism, that little idiom that he's using, that colloquial saying, since I've been a Christian, has only been interpreted about half a dozen different ways. So it's not impossible, but it's not easy either. It takes some effort and some getting down on your hands and knees and some humility, but it can be done. And that's why tonight's message is going to be called, Are You Conscious of Your Conscience? Now that's an adjective followed up by a noun. Conscience is the seat of where you discern right and wrong. And for those of us who have been regenerated, that is something that happens inside. So we're going to compare the spiritual man that has faith and now knows that all things are possible. There are no limitations. The natural man has been built by limitations. On the outside, using information of who he can be, who he can't be, what he can do, what he can't do. Are you tall enough, short enough? Are you strong enough? Are you pretty enough? Do you wear the right clothes? Do you, do you wear the right uh, societal acceptance? And they're constantly managing and contouring you 
to the present zeitgeist or the present age, uh, the, the present uh, milieu of the people. So if you're a natural man, you're on the outside trying to discern what your community, what your peers, what your neighborhood, all this learned behavior of what clothes you wear, what clothes you don't wear, what hairstyle you have, the home you live in, everything is a comparison. It's a comparison to other natural things and natural people. Now when I use the word comparison, that's not a favor. Living by continual comparison is not wise because you're always going to find something that, or something uh, 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 in life where someone has something better than you. And then coveting could step in and self-loathing. And then the other bad side of that coin and that wrong ideal is you're going to find someone that has much less than you. And pride could enter your heart. Pride that goes before a fall. Haughtiness before destruction. We don't need that arrogance. We need to live as our Father wants us to live with what our Father wants us to have. Not trying to be comparable to others. Not, not trying to measure ourselves against others. But just simply doing what Father, God, has asked us to do. So tonight, when we look at this, we want to look at the limited, the measure, and the comparable to the unlimited, the eternal, inside, the Christ in us. And the difference is, all things are possible. Now on the outside, you're constantly being told what you can't do, what you can't be, where you can't go where you don't measure up. Your father has never had thoughts about you in that way. It is eternal what he can do through you. There is no limit. There is no measure. Now, to the natural man, they're going to say, that's impossible. But with me, Jesus said, nothing shall be impossible unto you. You can call things that are not as though they were. You can decree a thing through prayer and through faith, through the unction and the mouth of the Holy Ghost, and it will be established unto you. The spiritual man knows that his sourcing comes from his Creator, Maker. That's why Jesus said, it is, thank you, Teresa, this is the regeneration. This is the quickening. This is the belief, the substance that was given to you by grace, this measure of faith. And as we learned Sunday, uh, we saw that that little grain of a mustard seed that links to John 12, that seed that must fall in the ground and die, the inside doesn't die. The inside of the seed is alive. It's full of inertia. My lifetime friend, to my benefit, Pastor uh, Curtis Kelly Wilson told me I'll never forget the day that he held those seeds, those grass seeds that we were planting because I was just helping him out, trying to be a brother, helping him out, trying to help him get going there. He said, there's life all in that seed. He said, now it looks dead. Now the outer shell will die so the inner life can come forth. And Paul's going to talk about this in 1 Corinthians 15 and we may look at that. We may stop in there. But it was time that God Himself, it behooved Him to be made like unto us, to return us to the regeneration that we could be made, that we could realize and understand we were made by God. That's what's been refreshing us and renewing us and recovering us and restoring us and regening us, regenerating us, with the mind of God. In the mind of God, we transmogrify from just human beings to Christ being. That you find your real you-ness from what God is, I am. I found out what I am by learning what God is. And God is my maker, creator. And He came to me in the bodily form and the person of sonship, Jesus Christ. 
He showed me that He's the Father of all sons and daughters, male and female, created He them. Now, it was His turn. The fullness of times had come. God sent forth His Son, the prototype, the one that we agreed to be made like. Back in Genesis 1.26, when morning stars were singing and all the sons and daughters of God shouted for glory. Now, I don't find it uh, against my maleness to be called the bride of Christ, being a man, and because with God there's neither male nor female. Even though you've been given a certain design to manifest on this side of eternity. That's why daughters are just as much sons of God, just as much in the ministry, just as much called of God as any man walking the face of the earth. They are our co-equals. They are our co-generals. They are not, as we've learned from the very weak translation, the weaker vessel. That does not, that is a very awful translation in the King James Version Bible. I'm sorry, King Jimmy and his 57 scholars missed the barn on that one. You need to look up the original Greek and get a revelation. You join with your wife in prayer because she's as equally powerful as a saved, born-again child of God as you ever thought to be. And if any two of you touching and agree on anything, the Bible said it shall be done. Oh my, I feel the anointing. I'm telling you, you've got a prayer partner that you've been united with that's as equally anointed, equally called, equally powerful, equally illuminated with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you're feeling good. I hope you're feeling revived because you can be healed. You can have a recovery of breath and this refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And He shall send Jesus, whom before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution, the restoring, hello brother Jack, the restoring of all things, my friends coming in. Praise God. Praise God. So there is a restitution, and I want you to know, without Jesus, I'd already be gone. Without Jesus, I'd already uh, be taking a dirt nap. But I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And yes, I was fearing. I was fearing. But not the evil of ending. I was fearing the sickness, but I also realized simultaneously that a new advent was about to begin in my life. That the shedding of this body for a moment, a time, and a season would mean the resurrection of my soul spirit from God. And I want you to know that uh, our wonderful sister, elder, uh, prophetess Cheryl has come in with uh, Hot Rod Jack and uh, we're glad to see him in Jesus' name. So as you turn to Matthew 19, 28 in your Bible, this true regeneration is the metanoia, the presence of the Spirit of God the Word, the living Word that is nigh thee, that is in thy mouth and in thy heart, that if thou shalt have a change of mind, a change of spirit, an awoken awareness, hey, I was before my mom and dad. I was here a long time before my mom and dad gave me my earth suit. You know, you go buy a suit, you may go to uh, Belks or Dillard's or one of these high-end, like Brother Ty, he goes to one of these real high-end haberdasheries, and he comes uh, peacocking in here with his uh, Bill Blast pinstripes styling and profiling on Sunday. Well, that's okay. you got to get a suit somewhere. And they measure him up. I'm picking. I'm just picking today. I love him. I love Ty. He's the most gracious man. He's a, he's a good picture of what a man should be. Certainly a good husband. So... We take on the earth suit that our mom and dad came together and provided for us, but God is the one working in the lower parts of the earth in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully making you. And all of your members were written in continuance, and they were fashioned, and they're found in this book. 
Your design of discovering who you really are is in the revelation and the inspiration of the volume of this book. You can recover your godliness. Your godliness. Your, your godness. Because He did call you gods in Psalm 82 and John 10. Twice. Now, we're not the God, but I'm as much a part of God, and I don't think it robbery to be equal with my Father, because I came from Him. Now, in understanding that, that means that the limitations that have tried to modify my behaviors since the day I came into my natural family, those limits are broke off. Those boundaries are now gone. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. One of the most wrong things you can ever do is continue to go back to an abusive family that never believes anything good about you and will never let you live above or beyond their condemnation or their limitation of who they think you are. But if you meet your Father God, oh my, all the limits come off, all the boundaries come off, and you begin to realize truly All things are possible to him that believeth. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengtheneth me. Don't tell me it can't be done. I know the God that made everything out here. Anything is possible to him that believeth. Now with man, it's going to seem impossible. And that's why the natural man receiveth not the things that be of God. Natural man and carnal man is limited to the education and the erudition of his intellect. If he can't think it and he didn't learn it in a book, he doesn't think it's possible. But Joshua, in the battle of Gibeah, as he fought for those that were in a covenant with the children of Israel as they were taking over their promised land, their inheritance, told the sun and the moon. They didn't find chapter and verse. He created that day. He was a living epistle during the time of that battle. There was nothing scriptural about him telling the sun and the moon to stand still in the valley of Agilon while he was fighting the battles of God. Lord have mercy. Thank you, Jesus. He literally was a living epistle. There's never been another day like it. And and he literally created a miracle by being in obedience to God, keeping a covenant with a group of people that came and joined themselves to him in the slaughter of those, again, much like Abraham, five kings. Abraham defeated five kings, and on that day, Joshua defeated five kings. So he came, he, he literally turned into a living word. And you need to say amen right there. You are a living word. You're living epistles seen and read of all men. That's why the best translation that society needs right now is the incarnation of sons and daughters of God who have been regenerated, renewed, restored, redeemed, and they realize the groaning and travailing of the earth. And we're here to establish a kingdom and to occupy until our King and Master and Lord, our friend, brother, our Rose of Sharon, our Lily of the Valley, the fairest of 10,000 to our soul, oh, I could go on in accolades, returns to this earth. We're making it what He called us to do. That's our commission. That's why we go into all the four corners of the world. And if we need to learn a language of another nation, God through the Holy Ghost has given us the ability to phonetically learn other languages so that we might communicate clearly to every nation, every kindred, and every tongue to spread this good news all around the world. That's good news. So when you become aware, what does righteousness say? What does relationship demand? Well, the Word, the living Word, the Logos, God's logic is in thy mouth and in thy heart that if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus and believe that your Father, our Father, which art in heaven, raised Jesus from the dead, 
that same Father will raise me from the dead. There's no death I'll ever face anymore without Him because death and hell follow Him. Death has to get permission from Jesus to touch me. Now Job knew that, and that's why the patience of Job endured, and that's why he kept appealing to God. And like it or not, God did entertain the request of Job. God showed up and had a discussion. Now I know it was difficult at first. God took all of His musings and all of His statements, and God retorted back towards Job, with 80 questions. He said, now, you've been questioning my motives as if I wasn't with you or I wasn't here and you've served me out of fear instead of faith. So now I'm going to question you and I'm going to show you how much I'm taking care of. Now, I can be like Job. Being in my choleric temperament, I can kind of, uh, uh, I've gotten at times in prayers and I was like, God, you need to sashay on down here and uh, start getting things done. We we got a lot going on here. And he said, shut up, Kevin. I'm taking more than you even realize. I'm taking care of more than you can ever imagine. And I don't want some people to be saved. I'm working so all people can know the grace of God because my grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. Not just for you. His grace is sufficient for the whole world, for everyone. His ability to forgive is His eternal and everlasting as He is. He is the almighty, forgiving, merciful, graceful God that came to us in the package, person, illumination of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, so that He could show that I can be tempted just like as ye are. See, it behooved Him to be made like unto us. God shows us that we are His idea, and our idea is to come back and to realize that He is our Father. That is the revelation of what we have to say tonight. And instead of calling it born again, He calls it the regeneration. Now watch this. When the disciples heard this old camel and needle situation, they started, you know, scratching their heads and say, well, who in the world? That's not easy to do. I'm feeling pretty good tonight. Thank you for praying for me. I need it. Thank you for praying for me. I want you to just put your hands towards the the thing, point them towards me and say, God, prosper the work of your servant's hand. God bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Because the blessing of the Lord makes me rich and He adds no sorrow to go with it. Amen. When His disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. I'm on 25. Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, with the anthropos, with the way men want to build up and hoard up and bring to themselves, He said, Well, with men, this is impossible. But with God, there's the limits taken off. Remember, with men, they're constantly telling you what's impossible. Kevin, you can't do this. Kevin, you can't do that. I've never liked the statement. Matter of fact, it's a huge turnoff for me because it's a, huge, it's a turnoff to my godliness inside of me. When you tell me what I can't do, then uh, I just go to the opposite end of the spectrum. You tell me I can't, I'm going to show you I can't. I'm going to show you I will because I can do all things. And I've been told to be strong. My son, therefore, be strong in the grace of that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. God's visited me several times in a fast, and I was at the edge of saying, God, I can't do it. And God came with angels. I believe now angels. I've been visited by angels unaware. I've been visited in long fast, and someone told me, hold on, you're going to make it. And I needed that encouragement, and, and I did make it. Many, many, many times. Of course, I don't do it openly. I don't tell everybody. I, that's not why I do it. I do it secretly. That's why God had to send an angel, because only God knew what I was really knowing. But anyway, but with God, with God, the limits are off. The boundaries are down. All things are for your sake. 
All things. Everything is working together for the good. Because God loves you and you love Him. All things are for your sake, is what He said in 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Right? That's what He said. While we look at the things, uh, not that are seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, they are eternal. All this is working together for our good, His apostle said. Well, then answered Peter, you know Peter, he's got a, He's got to stick his two cents in there. Peter piped up because he's still proven he's a, he's a man like Jesus. The rest of them are below the threshold of what's identified in the culture of that day as being grown men. So Peter says, I'm the other man in here. So, uh, behold, we have forsaken all. We have followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in, not when, but in the regeneration. That regeneration takes place in an awaked awareness. You are awaking and you're being aware that a substance, that the inner life of the seed, the outer shell dying, or the outer shell losing control to determine who you really are. The outer information no longer gets to say who and what you can do. There's an inner life that's greater than everything out here that's told you what you can and cannot do, what you can and cannot be, constantly making these determinations of who you are and who you're not. That no longer, that information no longer controls this Son of God. I have an inner life and that's where I know what I'm going to do. That's how I live from the Christ who dwells in my heart by faith. See, I passed the exam and Jesus lives right in here. Know you not that Jesus Christ dwells in you by faith? Know you not? Well, I do know it. And therefore, the greater one, He guides me. I'm not going by what it says out here. I'm going by what He says in here. And if He tells me to speak to the winds and the waves, I've seen my older brother do that. That means I can do that. I saw another son way back there in the battle of Gibeah tell the sun and the moon to stand still. I saw another brother in Isaiah 38 said, make the, the sundial on the uh, gnomon, on the sundial, make it go back 10 degrees and show me that I'm going to be healed. Give me that sign. And sure enough, the sun stopped rotating. Everything on his axis stopped. And 10 degrees, the gnomon on the sundial the gnomon is that, that uh, prism that goes up out of the flat screen on the round table, whereas they used to determine what was the time of day. Anyway, 10 degrees back, it did it. They came to Elisha, a man's chopping wood, the axe head flies off, flies into a muddy river. Oh Lord, what am I doing? I don't have enough money to buy another axe head. Elisha prayed and an iron axe head swam out of the water like a fish. Now, there is no scripture for that. He didn't quote chapter and verse, but he needed a wonder. And guess what? The wonder came to pass because he was called by his wonderful counselor who he knew to be as an everlasting father. That's what faith can do. That's the unlimited faith that God is releasing on the world through you. You're, you're a gateway. You're a door into the kingdom of God, a gateway. You everlasting doors. You gates of God. We're pouring out all of God is to let people come in through you, come in through your life, come in through your grace, come in through your forgiveness, come in through your mercy, come in through your love, come in through your attitude. Why? Because I don't think like the world. I'm not controlled by their limitations. I, you know, we don't have to compartmentalize God because we're here or there. He's God with me everywhere I go. I went to a baby shower this past Saturday. God the Holy Ghost, the gift of the word of knowledge began to move. And now I'm there at a baby shower eating cake, which I shouldn't be eating, but it was good. Uh, and, and, and giving God 
uh, prays for a set of twins that's about to be born to a sister and a godly family. And God the Holy Ghost showed up. I was right there at the right time at the right place. Somebody say amen. Someone said, oh, I wish that had been on Sunday morning when everybody could see it. Oh, we don't have to have everybody see it. My father saw it. There was a need and he used me to meet it. But it was him manifesting to her. It was God meeting her need through the knowledge and understanding of what God can do. Somebody say, praise God. In the regeneration. And what's going to happen? Well, the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory. You also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren, sisters, father. Now, forsaken means making God more important. It doesn't mean you hate your parents or your brothers or your sisters. You still love them, but now you love them God's way. You don't love them under the conditions and the terms and the limitations of the old family dy dynamic that never would allow you to get up and stand up. Now you love them God's way. But they no longer get to determine who you are. God determines who I am. God determines what I do. God is the greater that's living through me. Amen. Brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake. And yes, His name is Jesus Christ. I'm glad to report unto you that Jesus Christ is Lord. And to me, my knee bows and my tongue confesses to the glory that God is the Father. God has been revealed to the whole world through the prototype, the person, the Son, the Messiah, our Emmanuel, God with us. And His name was called Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall receive a hundredfold. That's what I got coming my direction. And as my beautiful sister here knows, which means if I want to go up to Lake Norman and go jetting around on a boat, she'd let me do it. Now, I've never asked her to do it, but all I'd have to do is ask because they've lived their whole life very open and giving and sharing and fellowshipping with their wealth. All i got to do is ask. i got a boat right up here on Lake Norman. Now, it's on Cheryl's Cove. That's where the boat is. But all i got to do is ask, and I can go motorboat. Isn't that right? I already know that. I know it for a fact. I know it in my heart for a fact. So it's as good as, it's better than owning a boat because they get to deal with the boat and I just get to drive it. Praise God. So, ah, anyway, anyway, everybody say a hundredfold. And shall, that's in this life, a hundredfold here, a hundredfold here, like Isaac, who in his first planting had a hundredfold harvest. He goes in among the Philistines, makes one planting, he outgrows and outharvests everyone else around. And they became aware, who is this guy? Oh, that's the son of Abram, the son of Abraham. And he had a hundredfold harvest. Now, I'm not turning God into money. I'm turning God into blessing. I'm turning God into letting things work out. See, I don't think the blessing is limited and bound up in monetary worth. That's how man measures things. I want to measure things the way God measures things. And He measures things by giving me a measure of faith where I can call things that are not as though they were. Hallelujah. Praise God. And shall inherit a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. And if you want to check me on Isaac, check Genesis 26, 12 out because that's where he got a hundredfold. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now, it's an interesting statement that the metanoia, the change of one's heart, is the effect of the change of one's mind. That the mouth begins to confess that I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And in that belief, I believe He's my Father too. I believe that Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I believe that He's the captain 
of my salvation. He's the one that showed me what Father is and what Father can do and that I have the same dad. That's why we cry out, Abba, Father. Dear Daddy, Lord Jesus, thank you, God. I know I have a Father who never leaves me, who never forsakes me, who never fails me, and is never discouraged. Now, there's moments when, and it's not often, because it's not really in my temperament. I always feel like I'm plugged in and got a plan. Most people who know me know that. There's only been a few times when I'm kind of like shaky on things. I'm like, hey, what's going on? But anyway, I get plugged back in and I'm on the road again. Praise God. On the road again. Anyway, I, I love him because he loves me. Ty's on the road again, so we give him thanks. We give God thanks. So look at that. There it is, the regeneration. Now remember, when he's correcting Nicodemus in John 3, he says, don't marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you think you originated with Mr. and Mrs. Nicodemus. Mr. and Mrs. Demas. Because apparently you're Nicholas Demas. Nicodemus. You, you. <laughs> you should laugh. It does good for the soul like a medicine. You think you started with Mr. and Miss Demas. Well, let me tell you something, Nick Demas. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to come back to realize you were around a long time before you got your earth suit from your mom and dad. You were a son of God just like God Himself, which was in spirit. Then you got a body. And when you were born out of your mother's womb, which provided her redemption by producing another image of God, when you... <gasps> took that first breath through your nostril, you became a living soul. And God has always wanted you to know that the dominion of your person is not regulated by natural people or natural things or the outside world. Greater is He that is in you. Now if you would, let's turn to the treatise of the Apostle Paul in Titus 3. I've always loved this. And Curtis, if you would, you were right about the uh, heat. Could you take the log off the fire, sir, please? Thank you. You did call it, and I'm admitting it. could tell a joke right now, but it might seem uh, a little bit off, but I won't. Titus 3. This is a man that walked in the same spirit that Paul walked in, and that spirit was the Spirit of God. Walk we not in the same steps? Walk we not in the same spirit? That's what the apostle had to say about this man called Titus. Amen. That's quite a compliment coming from the Apostle Paul. But look at this. Verse 4 is where we're jumping in. That's where you jump in the deep end. Now, the kiddie pool starts up in verse 1, but the deep end of the pool starts in verse 4. So go ahead and do a cannonball with me. You can go off the diving board if you want to do it. That's the way I would do it. But uh, make a bigger splash. But anyway, but after that the kindness and love of God, our Savior. God, our Savior. God, our Savior, which came in the person of who? Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but His desire of relationship for us. He's going to pay the price to have a relationship for us. And we all want a friend who proves to us, I want to be your friend. I, if I fail you, forgive me. I don't, I, I, I don't mean to, because you know, sometimes I'm not as, not as on top of things as I used to be. But it's always good to know that the person that we're friends with wants to be friends back with us, right? How many knows how good it is to be on a two-way street? One-way streets turn into dead ends, and if you go down that alley too many times, 
You'll get tired of backing out of there and it'll come to the place that you realize this ain't worth it. Yes, Ty? Oh, okay, I thought you were asking a question. Anyway, I'm just kidding. I love you. The love of God, our Savior, towards man appear, not by works of righteousness, not, but not because of what we did, but according to His mercy. What type of mercy? Well, in Isaiah 55, 3, it said, The sure mercies of David. And you got to understand and do a complete study on David's life. And trust me, friend, you ain't come close to what David's done. My, my Lord, David killed as many people as some of, you, some of you have cussed in your life. I mean, he took whole people's lives. He just killed them and wiped them out. And God said, I'm going to use him as the template of mercy. Sure mercy. A mercy that endures forever. But according to his mercy... He saved, redeemed, gathered us, reminded us, renewed us, regenerated us. How did He save us? Well, let's see. By the washing of... Oh, there it is. Born from above. This word literally means that you realize that your first origination came from God, not your fleshly mom and dad. Now, they were used of God... And they are to be honored. You should honor your mother and father. You may not always love what they do, but you should always honor your mother and father. People mistake honor and love. You can honor people that you don't always love all their decisions. But because they're your mom and dad, you give them honor. Now sometimes that's tough, because parents can be tough on us. They can be demanding. Yeah. So, how do you do it? By the washing. What's He washing off of us? The world and its limitations. The world and its boundaries. The, the world and its measurements. And its comparisons. And what the world says you should be. I don't care what the world says I should be. I want to be what my Father wants me to be. I want to walk with Him. I want to know Him. I want to love Him. They don't get, the world doesn't get to groom me or tailor me or suit me for its own purposes. I have another purpose, which is much deeper in my conscience of God. I'm aware, I'm awake to my Heavenly Father, where I really originated from in the washing of regeneration. He's washed away all these other word curses and limitations and abuses, and struggles, and trials, and these stopgap measures where they're trying to hinder you from going forward. Why? Because I realize now, I I keep saying it, little children, you are God, and have overcome them. Why? Because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. See, when I go pray, I know now I'm not praying to nobody. I'm praying to a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm thankful, God, because I know that Thou hearest me when I pray, even when I don't pray in King Jimmy language, even when I don't pray in King James Version lingo. God still hears me. I can talk to Him the way I talk, and me and God talk. That's why He told me when I had blacked out with my heart attack, He talked to me just like a friend. He said, thanks for not joining the other team. That means a lot to me. And I was like, amen. It means a lot to me too. I know you're not like that. You're you're my loving Savior. And your desire, I am my beloved's and His desire. You know, God desires to be with you far more than you desire to be with Him. It's not based on how much you want to be with Him. It's based on the fact that you're His beloved and His desire is towards you. So look at this. By the washing of regeneration, born from above. And if you understand that word, Ephesians 3, 1 makes more sense that you set your affections on things that are above. You see, the way of life is above to the believer so that the man can escape from hell beneath. I don't want to fall. That's why we keep under our body. I don't want to fall to the natural, carnal Uh, nature that receiveth not the things that be of God. To be carnally minded 
is to live in the darkness of death and the control and the limitations of present society, of what they say you can and cannot do. But to believe in God is to have your imagination funneled through the power of wonder and then all things become possible. You can do anything. God said you have the right to ask for the nations. You can ask God, which nation is mine? Send me. Lord, I'll go. Give me a nation. I'll go and be the missionary. I'll go and sacrifice my outer man, my outer shell. I'll let the real inner life of this seed of Abraham, I'll let the natural Kevin on the outside die so the real Kevin on the inside can come forth and grow into a loving planting of the Lord. And Isaiah called it a tree of righteousness. A tree that has the ability to bear 12 manner of fruits. Yeah, and there may be some grafting. God may have to cut some old dead limbs off and graft some good limbs in to teach you that you can produce love in ways that you never imagined. That's the wonder of it all. That's the wonder. And I'm not going to live on the sides of the bank of the river. I want to be planted right slap dab in the middle of the crystal sea of glass. I want to be right in the middle of what God's doing. Amen. The washing of regeneration and, this is how he does it, by what means? And renewing of the Holy Ghost which God, our Father, our Abba, has shed on us abundantly. Now abundantly is important there because I've come that you might have life and you might have it more. Okay, there we go. There we go. There's that abundant covenant. There's that abundant life. That means you don't just get enough. You have more than enough. Praise God. You can't just have one piece of blueberry pie. You can have the whole pie. If that's what you want. Now you'll have blue teeth after that and ask me how I know. But anyway, which He shed on us. See, Jesus' death wasn't accidental. It was intentional. He was driving to that cross. He was going to pay that price. He knew that He didn't spill His blood. He shed His blood. He could have called angels at any time to stop all this from going on. But He knew that what He was buying, what He was purchasing, what He was paying for was more eternally valuable than His own life and His own blood. And therefore He paid the penalty for us all. When God laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And tell me not to praise my Jesus. Tell me not to pray in His name or preach in His name or reveal God in His name. Not going to happen, my friend. Jesus is my Savior. He is my Lord, which He shed on us. God shed on us abundantly through the vehicle and the agency and the temple of His body filled with the Holy Ghost coming upon Him when He came up out of the water with His cousin John who had baptized Him. And He said, This is My beloved Son. or He's going to produce My beloved sons in whom I'm well pleased, both male and female, both female and male. Don't want to leave nobody out there. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified, glorified, sanctified, and perfected forever. Those are all in the past tense. Your sins are paid for. Forever. All past, all present. And if there be any of the future, that's covered too. Now, I don't have a heart to want to commit sin in the future. But if it happens, it's already taken care of. My Father God is already paid for. He's the eternal one. He knows all my past, all my present, and all my future. And when He saved me, that's how He saved me. Past, present, and future. It's already covered. Somebody say praise God to that. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I love that according to the hope of eternal life. If you'll just go forward. 
in Titus 1, 2, he said that we were in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God knew what He was doing. I'm just now catching up with what He's been doing and what He had in mind and what He was performing and what He was accomplishing because it was always in His mind to give us this hope of eternal life. That I'm an heir according to the hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life. Why? Because my Father who is God, and He cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested His Word through uh, the foolishness of preaching. That's why He uses me. Not because I'm mighty, not because I'm strong, not because I'm more intelligent than anyone else, not because I'm a scholar. God took this nobody, turned him into his somebody, and now I can tell everybody and anybody about a Savior that can deliver you from anything. Amen? Praise God. But hath in due times, right when it was necessary, I don't care if you're at the dry cleaners, at the gas station, if you're down there at Walmart, some of you shop at Harris Teeters, nothing against that. I know while you're getting your lobsters. I got you. It's okay. God loves everybody. Some of you uh, shop at those highfalutin grocery stores. Uh, but anyway, uh, the rest of us, and listen, I don't mind being a king at Walmart. I know some people wouldn't be caught dead in there. You got to be a king somewhere. I might as well be the king at Walmart. Praise God. Anyway, that's where the masses are. That's where the people are. That's where I think you'd find Jesus. I do. Praise God. But hath in due times manifested His word through preaching. Uh, and that was at a baby shower for me this past Saturday. Which is committed unto me according to the commandment, the command or the purpose of God our Savior. And God our Savior is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now look at that. Regeneration. The limits are off. See, modified behavior, you were given a certain quality inside of you. And your parents have tried to modify that. Your siblings have tried to modify that. The school, the government, the laws, everything has tried to modify your behavior to keep you from believing that anything is possible. They want you to have a carnal mind so that you can crucify the influence of the Spirit. And you can have a mind to say, why that can't happen. Why that's impossible. Well, when it comes to God, I don't have to figure out how it can be possible. I know the one that makes it possible. He, that's His job. My job is to believe for it. There shall be nothing impossible to him or her who believes. That's with the limits and the boundaries taken off. Now, let's look at this. Remember, we're conscience. There is a, a faculty of knowing inside of me, internally, of right and wrong, left and right, up and down, physics, basically, height, width, breadth, and to know the love of God, which passes knowledge. I've got something that's better than knowledge. It's called the love of God. The love of God's better than knowledge. God just does it because He loves. Because He loves. You may be smart enough and tricky enough and have enough proverbs in you where you have been able to talk your way out of helping people, but that's not God's way. God loves people and even helps them when they're hurting themselves. You help them because you love them. Now turn with me to Romans 13. Romans 13, 9. Now we're going to get into some statements that are virtuous in the living. And it's all about the civil uh, uh, statements, uh, the ten sayings, the ten promises of treating your fellow man like they are the image of God. 
Because how you treat others is a manifestation of how you love God. If you're poor in treating your fellow man, you can't tell me how much you love God. Because to really love God is to really love your brother whom you can see. If you don't love your brother who you can see, right? I see you over there. Uh, then you can't say that the love of God dwells in you, right? These alts, these hang-ups, these issues, we've got to get through that and love our fellow man. That's why we love uh, Billy and his wife up in uh, West Virginia that are starting a church. And I hope he's listening tonight, even though the back screen's not on and I can't see it. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm still I'm plugging on. I'm plugging on. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Now look at this. This is the same criteria. This is the second time that this has been stated by what formerly was Saul of Tarsus, the rich young ruler, when he named off commandments 5 through 9 as claiming to be righteous and asked Jesus as a young man, What lack I yet? Well, he's going to go back over it now. This is the second time he's gone through the civil statements of treating your brother like they were created in the image, likeness, and dominion of God. These are the ten sayings, five through nine. Look at him. This is the Apostle Paul. He said it first as Saul of Tarsus in the Gospels. Now he's saying it again, a converted son who's walking in the ministry. And look what's changed. This is important. This is good stuff. I need you to listen in. Ooh, get on the knobs, turn that back in. Praise God, or cut the volume up. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery with your fellow brother's wife. Thou shalt not kill or murder your brother. Thou shalt not steal from your brother. Thou shalt not bear, fit, uh, bear false witness. And now look at this. He's been delivered from something. In Romans 7, he said there was the discovery of sin in him because he had an evil desire and he was coveting. But now he adds on the tenth. Instead of five, there's six. And he says, finally, because of Jesus Christ, he's become aware of his coveting when he was coveting the position in the, in the place of Gamaliel the Great. He thought he was more qualified and better suited to carry out the will of Moses and the law of Moses through the Sanhedrin court and the Pharisaical doctrine. He was coveting the place, the position, and the power when he got affidavits from the church to go bind them and haul them back to Jerusalem, even consenting to the death of Stephen because he was coveting. He was trying to prove he was the better man. That Gamaliel was just a frumpy old man who couldn't get the job done anymore. Well, God got that coveting of position and power out of him. Look at it. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. He says it again, not as a rich young man. He says it now as a born-again, regenerated apostle. And he adds in to the statement, oh yeah, and that other one, which was, uh, sin revealed in me. My evil desire was that I was coveting. My evil desire was that I was coveting position and place and power. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended any other saying of God, any other promise of virtue, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, oh, I like it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, which is likened unto the first. I'm glad you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. But the way you love His image, likeness, and dominion is how you really love God. If you fail with your brother, you can't stand there and tell me how much you love God. You can't tell me you love God and hate people and use partiality, and you're not easily entreated, and no one can talk to you, or everyone is just on the edge of upsetting your sensibilities or touching on your issues. You've got to get a control of those hurts in, in your soul and get them healed. Let the light shine in your darkness. 
because the darkness will not overpower it. Be illuminated in your pain. Go to your prayer life. God's showing you how to pray. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. I love it. Because if it hurt me, I don't want to do it to you. If it left me out, I don't want to leave you out. If they didn't help me, I'm going to make sure I help you. I want to be supportive, affirming, and believing. Amen? That's why we have a new generation of preachers. Let me take a swig. You never heard it called that? A swig. What's what we say down in South Gastonia? Swig of water. Take a swig. Swig. Anyway, look at this. Those that have met our God, God is love. The God of love worketh no ill if he's in your heart, worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling. It covers and it's greater than all the law. Law, that love will never lead you to break one of God's sayings. And that knowing the time that the new covenant has come, and the old covenant is antiquated. It's old and it's vanishing away. It should be gone. There's a new grace in town. And that grace is full of mercy and forgiveness. That we can become boldly before God with our brother. Knowing the time that is now, it's high time to live the high calling. To awake out of sleep. This is the love that woke up Adam to see his beautiful wife that had been taken out of his side. Now the way back into the heart of God has been made by Jesus on the cross when they pierced his side and forthwith came the blood and the water. The baptism of blood and the baptism of water, which we have both. So my way back into God's heart, the pathway has been made. So let me follow the washing and regeneration of the Word through the water of the Word and the redemption of the blood of Christ, and I'll find myself back into the heart of the Father. Amen, Brother Kello. And what will I realize? Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. You're getting closer and closer to the heart of God. You become His heart. You become His body. You become His agency. You become His manifestation. You become His image. His likeness. And you know that the dominion is unlimited, without boundaries. All things are possible. You can do all things. This is to the heavens and back. Angels ascending and descending. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of the carnal and the natural man who lives in the reason of education and erudition and intellect, and scholarship, and tells you you have to do this, that, and the other. Or you can simply believe and let God figure out the this, that, and the other. I don't know how He's going to do it. I just know He can. I don't know how He can heal you of cancer. I just know He does, and He can, and He will. I know you can live through a massive heart attack. I'm proof. I know you can live through bypass and a new uh, 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 ventricle the a, on the A side. Uh, amen. Even if it has to stick a, a pig valve in there like he did for me. Praise God. Praise God. That's why I get scrubbing around on the farmyard. Something takes me over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have my own jokes. <laughs> That it's high time to awake out of sleep. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the evil works of a natural carnal man. I don't want to live in the darkness of death or the death of darkness any longer. I don't want to live in the evil lust, pride, and the, the vision of my life, the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. These things are not of the Father, they're of the world. You're just walking in the group think of being like everyone else instead of being the individual Son of God that you're called to be. You know, I think for myself, when you say something to me, 
That's got to gee ha ha with my brain. I, that's got to make un, make sense to me. Or I'm not with you, saith Kevin. I'm not with you at this moment. Uh, you got to get me on the right page, because with my if my brain's not gee ha ha, we ain't plowing that road. I'm telling you right now, you can knock yourself out, but yours truly ain't going. Anyway, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Oh, I'll be naked. Not so fast, my friend. I have a robe of righteousness, white, fine linen, and clean, because that is the relationship of saints to the Father. Let us put on the armor of light, no longer dwelling in darkness, the armor of light, the light that shined in my heart, the light that shined into the darkness and the brokenness and the abuse of my soul, and that darkness comprehended it not. And when you cut the light on, darkness can't hang around. It just flees. Darkness does not hang around when you cut the lights on, and the light got cut on in here. That's why Paul said, Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, how you endured a great fight of affliction, because everybody in the world felt very threatened that you weren't walking to their limitations, comparisons, and drumbeat anymore. They didn't like the fact that you had a new maestro, a new band leader inside of you, someone uh, guiding the Philharmonic, telling you how to live and how to do. They wanted you to stay in lockstep with the ways of the world so they can continue to sear their, their conscience with a hot iron of natural, carnal thinking. But thank God you broke out of that type of mindset. And now you have the faith to move mountains. And I told that mountain of the law, I went to it and I said, Be cast in yonder sea. You Sinai, you don't get to tell me if I'm right with God or not. You're not the covenant that makes me walk with God. Be thou cast into yonder sea. That's why you have faith. You've got to go to your mountain. You can read it in the Bible, in Mark 12, but you've got to believe it and you've got to say it. No wonder John said in the book of Revelation, And I saw a mountain that burned with fire cast into the sea. Why? That's the same place my sins were cast. So the source of my condemnation, the result of my condemnation, and the damnation of my sin were all thrown into the depths of the sea. None of it can be used against me anymore. I give grace for grace. So you're not going to get me on that one, friend. I've taken the court system, the laws, the penalty, the sin, the condemnation, the judgment... It's all been thrown into the depths of the sea. And my Savior taught me how to do that. My Father, God, after I met Jesus Christ, He showed me that that's possible. Well, how did He do that? Ask Him. I just know it's done. Amen? That's, 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 that's pretty good stuff. Let us walk honestly, as in the day. Not like I used to be, my call to remembrance the former days, right? Once the light got cut on, they always think it's, it's crazy that you, walk, that you walk not with them to the same excess of riot. They don't like you being certain about Jesus. As Peter said in his second epistle, I want to taste it. I taste that word in my mouth. I hope you taste it because it tastes good right now. I want you to know that's good truth. Why? We don't walk in that darkness anymore. These are wells without water, clouds. They are carried with a tempest. 2 Peter 2, 17, 18. To whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Well, I hope not. I hope you come out of that darkness and walk in the light. For when they gr speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Well, I've gotten wise to their allurements. You can't drag me back into that garbage that Jesus brought me out of. I've been insulated. He called me and separated me. And then He insulated me. And then He integrated me. Now, 
Why well, I used to fear them when I was a weak, young son. Now they fear me because they realize He won't go with you into darkness, but He will pull you into light every time. He's going to love you anyway. He's going to be graceful anyway. He's going to pray for you on the spot, on the sidewalk, in the highways, in the hedges, everywhere I go. Jesus is Lord. If I'm getting a bottle of a Worcestershire sauce, I met the two nice ladies in the deli, and we started having choich right there. I said, I've seen some of that baby, baby, uh, baby sliced Swiss cheese. And I said, oh my, that makes me think of baby Jesus. And that lady said, praise God, brother. I said, amen, let's have church right back here in the deli. Praise God, a, a big old food dog, I mean food lion. There's where we were, having church in a public place. It was beautiful. It's beautiful. Why not have fun? Why not go ahead and have fun? Have the joy of the Lord. Make you leap for joy. Make people glad that you came there. That you're not just a patron. You're there to appreciate, respect, and honor, and love. People can tell what type of spirit you put off. Have good fruit. Learn to be, learn to be in season, out of season. Hey, if you're happy, put a smile on your face. Notify your face. Let everybody know, hey, there's a happy person in here. There's a happy person locked up in this body. And I won't be locked into it forever. I may feel like a caterpillar crawling around right now, but I'm going to go into a self-imposed death state, and after three months, I'll rise again, and this time I'll have some of the most beautiful wings you could ever imagine. With the iridescent, and instead of crawling, I'll be flying. Praise God. And as Psalm 91 said, I'll fly away. Oh, that old song. Praise God. Isn't it beautiful? So there it was. They allure. They allure through much wantonness. Those that were clean. That word clean means certain. Certain. I know I met Jesus. I know who came into my life. I know He's my Savior. I call Him the way. I call Him the truth. I call Him the life. I call Him the Lamb of God, and I want to follow Him with us to wherever He goeth. Amen. I want to walk as He walked. I want to follow in His footsteps. Amen. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. They want what you've got, but they're not willing to reach out and take it. Those that were clean, certain, escape from them who live in error while they promise them liberty, while they promise you liberty and freedom in the flesh and carnality. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. And I will not be brought into bondage of that no more. No. No, no, no. I'm living free. I'm so close to the other side now, I want to make a good lick. I might be on some of my last laps around this big old sun in our galaxy. And when I'm going around for this last, I want to come in the winter. I'm going for the checkered flag. Uh, I, I'm running the race. I, I, I want to be able to go around one more time and have the checkered flag hanging out of my car saying, I win, praise God. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith, praise God. And then uh, turn the flag over to someone else. Not riding in drunkenness, nor chambering in wantonness, not in strife and envying, but I put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make provisions for the flesh to fulfill or live by the control of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, the thorns and the thistles that we get ourselves interwoven with that can come and choke the Word and render it unfruitful. We've got to be wiser than that. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Listen, that's Jesus. That's what He said. Well, are you conscious, adjective, of your conscience now? Are you where you make right and wrong decisions? Do you know that you're doing it with someone? You see, we didn't get to 1 Corinthians 15, though I could have. The first man was of the earth and earthy. The second man is the wielding authority of God. The Lord from heaven. Adam was the first production man, sure enough. But he was made after the image, likeness, and dominion of the prototype of all humanity. 
That was Jesus Christ. So the second man, the Lord from heaven, the wielding authority of the Father Himself, came and put on a robe of humanity. Put on sonship. He became a son of man to show us what sons of God live like, look like, and talk like that are fully connected and aware of their Father. Are you aware of that today? Have you been awoken? Do you see the metanoia, the change of heart, that changes the mind? Do you have that renewing of mind? I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, to me, all things have become new. See, I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. So I want to say that I love Him tonight. And the time has come and gone. Wow, we were speed preaching. I've been taking my classes at the Evelyn Woodhead uh, speed reading. And apparently it's working. Praise God. So let's lift our hands and say, I love Him because He first loved me. Echo His truth everywhere you go because you are living epistles seen and read of all men. I love you tonight, Bishop Kevin L. Kellogg. Amen.